Welcome to Health IQ. I'm Dr. Alan Siegel, your host. Tonight we have a special guest, Dr. Frank Contessa with the Westchester Health Associates. Uh, welcome, Dr. Frank. How are you doing, sir? Very well, thank you. Thank Good. you for having me. Uh, Dr. Frank, you're an internist, okay, and you work in a community-based practice. Uh, you're also a local guy growing up in the area. Tell me what it's like to be a, a local internal medicine doctor in a community practice. What sure. type of uh, patients are you seeing? No, it, well, number one, it's, it's, a, it's great to practice in my hometown. Um, living and working in the same town, some people think that isn't such a great thing, but I actually really like it. Um, number one, it's nice to be close to home because I'm never far away, but I also like running into people, you know, in the community, in the supermarket, in the restaurants. They're usually very polite, yeah. and they don't do curbside consults and say, hey, listen, my arm hurts over here. Yeah. Um, they respect your time as a doctor. They do. Nice, right? they, they really do, and I enjoy being part of the community. Yeah. And as an internist, you probably see a, a wide gamut of uh, various types of patients, probably from adolescents all the way to elderly, and everything in between in terms of, like, what can affect various populations of, of the community. Um, so what are some of the more common conditions that you may see in your practice on a day-to-day -day basis? Sure. You're absolutely right. Internal medicine, one of the things that I love about it is that you never know what's going to walk in the door. It can be just about anything. One of the reasons that I didn't subspecialize was because I didn't want to limit myself to just one part of the body or one group of illnesses. I really like seeing just about anything. And I'm never bored because just about anything can walk in the door. Um, this time of year, which is spring and really coming into summer, there's a lot of things that we should talk about, uh, things like tick-borne diseases, allergies, that we're seeing quite a bit of these days. It's a transitional time of year, so definitely things that may not be occurring during the winter, like the flus and the colds and the sinus infections, things start to transgress into some other, other illnesses, right? So Absolutely. You, you kind of seasonally uh, know what's going on. Flu so. season is pretty much over. Um, and interestingly, because we had such a mild winter, the ticks never really stopped biting. Yeah. <laughs> I was removing ticks from people in January and, and December when they really should be hibernating. Uh, yeah. and, and if I didn't remove the tick myself, I really wouldn't have believed that people come in and say, oh, I was bitten by a tick, really? It's January. Right. But if they, were, they were real tick right. bites. Well, so. that's actually interesting information because patients should know that they may be, if they do start experiencing symptoms and not thinking that they've even been outside that much or that the ability for a tick to be you know, out and active in sure. the middle of the winter, uh, so it's, it's good information that the patients do know about that. Absolutely. So what are some common symptoms of, of Lyme disease, or, sure. or in that case, maybe other tick-borne diseases that may present like Lyme? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about Lyme first, and then I do want to circle back to some of the other tick-borne illnesses that people may not know about that we're starting to see in this area. Um, Lyme, first of all, uh, people come in all the time, and one of the most common reasons for people to come in when they're not feeling well is fatigue. And he said, you have to check me for Lyme because I just don't have enough energy lately. I'm just feeling really tired. It must be Lyme. And sometimes it is, but usually it's not. Right. So Lyme disease, you don't have to have knowledge of a tick bite. About only a third of people actually remember the tick bite. Right. And realize or, that they had a tick. Or removing the tick. Or removed it. Um, the early signs of Lyme are really flu-like symptoms. Um, Low-grade fever, um, muscle aches fatigue, headache, things like that. Um, many people, it's often very mild in a lot of people, and they miss it. Yes. They often say, you know, I thought I was coming down with something, but then I got better. And then they ignore it. And then stage two comes a couple of weeks later. Okay. That's so when so you might develop some symptoms. Okay. Correct. That's when you might develop the rash, which not everybody gets. Right, I was going to say, so not, not a large percentage of people get that bullseye rash. Everyone's always looking for it on their body. Sure. I didn't get the rash. I didn't get the bullseye. I didn't get this. The, but the data really varies. Yeah, yeah. The, it, it can be as little as 25% of people and as high as 50 to 60% of people in different studies that actually develop the rash of Lyme. And by the way, another good piece of information for your viewers to know is that a tick bite in and of itself can cause local redness at the site of the bite. There's uh, substances in the saliva of the tick that uh, cause irritation and redness. And people sometimes come in and say, I took a tick off the other day. It's red. I need to be treated for two weeks for, for Lyme. For Lyme disease. And that's not necessarily the case. Right. Because most people who do remove a tick are going to find some degree of redness surrounding the site. Yeah. Now, is it, is it common or true, or, or did the stat show... 24 hours, if you can remove a tick within the first 24 hours, that you're, you're almost very unlikely, I wouldn't say 100% not likely, but the statistics of you getting Lyme are very low. You're absolutely case. right. Yeah. A tick has to be attached 
and feeding on you for 24 to 36 hours before it can transmit Lyme into your body. The actual uh, organism that causes Lyme lives in the gastrointestinal system, the stomach of the tick. Okay. So as the tick is feeding on your blood, it's sort of regurgitating sure. back. And that takes about 24 to 36 hours. So if you were out gardening this afternoon, and tonight you go to take a shower, and you take off a tick, there's very little chance that you're going to uh, contract Lyme. If you do remove a tick, and you're not sure how long it's been, within 24 hours you should contact your doctor, because we can prescribe a preventative dose of antibiotic. It's really just a one-time double dose of antibiotic, specifically doxycycline that we use. And that's very good at preventing uh, the transmission of Lyme if you did happen to remove a tick. If you're, so if you're not sure about the time period of when the tick may have attached to your body and it, maybe you didn't notice it and then a day or two later, you know, so then sort of uh, preventively you, you do take the antibiotic therapy to yes. suppress that. And, and, and it's that not does, a full course. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's just a one-time dose, but it really should be given within 24 hours of removing the tick. So it's not a 7 to 10 or 14 day no. situation, it's just a, no. a couple of days? It's 14 days if we're treating actual Lyme disease. Okay. But if you're not sure, we just give that one-time dose, a but one don't, dose. don't wait to don't call wait. your doc, right. because sometimes I'll get those visits too. Oh, I took a tick off four days ago. Well, it's kind of too late to really do the, the preventative thing. Let's just wait and see what develops. Right. And then if you do have a full-blown uh, case of Lyme disease or it's diagnosed, you know, maybe then that second phase, like you mentioned, then you know a course of antibiotics would be would obviously be needed at that point. Absolutely. Now, what, what you hear about long-standing Lyme are people that have gone months or years sometimes right. with not being diagnosed with Lyme, and sure. then they developed advanced symptoms, neurological symptoms, uh, fibromyalgia type symptoms, you know, real uh, more severe symptoms. And sometimes they'll have to uh, go to IV treatments, rocephin, other types of mm -hmm. stronger antibiotics. Uh, but it seems like some of those people do get better and some, some necessarily don't. So, so what you is the You have to be case? a little bit careful. Yeah. These days, because we're so um, aware of Lyme, and is one of the first things we think of in a certain group of symptoms, very few people reach the late stages of Lyme. Almost everybody's going to get treated. Because everyone's aware of it now. More because aware of it. The patients doctors and docs are, are all aware. Yeah. What people used to call chronic Lyme, which there's debate whether that really even exists, um, were people from years ago when, when Lyme first hit the scene, and they went years without being diagnosed or treated because nobody really knew what it was. So they went seven, eight years, nine years, without being treated, these people did develop neurological problems, cardiovascular problems, problems with the muscle of the heart. There were all sorts of problems that developed Long from that. But that's really rare now. That's rare now. Okay. What I find is that a lot of people, you know, every doctor has a couple of patients that you're just not sure what's wrong with them. Sure. They have real symptoms that, you, and you don't think they're crazy. You right. really yeah. think that they have these things. And you send them to every specialist under the sun. And they've had every test. They have had a, mil a million dollar workup. And they come back and they say, I'm still having these symptoms and nobody has an answer for me. And they find their way to a Lyme specialist who doesn't necessarily have to be an infectious disease doctor. Sometimes these are just people who sort of branched off and became Lyme specialists. And I tell people, listen, be really careful because Lyme can be a catch-all. When you have these mystery patient, patients that nobody really... No other diagnosis. They say, you know what? Yeah. This is chronic Lyme. Right. We're going to give you weeks or months of intravenous therapy that may or may not be covered by your insurance company. Yeah, it could be rather expensive, yeah. And, and really weaken their immune system Correct. and cause a whole bunch of other problems. And it may so, not yeah. be the right yeah. thing to do, so be right. really careful yeah. when you're dealing with these Lyme specialists. Unless it's a proper infectious right. disease doc, right. you have to be a little bit careful. So the good news is, you know, early, early detection, uh, early treatment, most people get a, a good recovery these days. And it's and, totally and, treatable. And that's totally treatable. So it doesn't per, right. you know, persist in your body. It's not like the shingles virus that you right. have it, since you're a kid. Exactly. Yeah. Um, it's, it's treated right. and right. it's gone. Right. It's so, no longer there. So everyone can sleep a little bit better with that news. Uh, now, you mentioned some other tick-borne diseases that maybe people sure. aren't as familiar with. Absolutely. And, and what is the, are those just as treatable? And, and, and is the diagnosis a lot different? Absolutely. Than, than I want to get into that in just one second. There's one other piece of information I kind of wanted your viewers to know about. Um, and that's the Lyme disease test, the blood test for Lyme disease. Okay. I get a lot of people coming in and they removed a tick last week. And they say, you know, I'm feeling tired, I have these symptoms, can you do a blood test and check me for Lyme? I want you to take my blood, check me for Lyme disease. And I say, well, no, 
because even if you have Lyme, that test is going to be negative. It takes four to six weeks because we're actually testing for the antibody to the Lyme. So that test is going to be negative for really four to six weeks, even if you're we sure you have Lyme. So don't run to your doctor and ask him to take blood. Right, it takes a while for the cyst, uh, for That's to test right. positive. If we're going to decide to treat you, it's because either we find the rash or your story is good and say, listen, I removed the tick, I'm having flu-like symptoms a week later. And that might be enough for your doctor to determine that, yeah, this really might be Lyme. Let's go ahead and treat for the two weeks. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the test. So over the years, the, the testing has changed a little bit. There's always been the standard, I believe it's the Western blot test. Is that still the standard test? That, that's the, the Western kind of, blot is the, goal, is, is the, the gold better standard. test. Okay. There's uh, the screening test called ELISA. Okay. And when you do that, if that becomes positive, if that's, if that's positive, most labs will automatically do the Western blot. Okay. And in the Western blot, we can actually determine do you have active Lyme right now? Or you may have had Lyme in the past, and we can determine. People say, oh, once you're positive, the test is always going to be positive. That's true, but we can usually tell the difference because of the types of, of antibodies that we're looking at. Right, yeah, so like your doctor more can determine. And, and, and older exposure antibodies. Correct. So, okay. we, can deter we can differentiate that. All right, so that's, that's interesting. So, uh, so can you test for these other diseases as well? <laughs> so, yeah, these other diseases. Um, specifically, um, there's Ehrlichia or Ehrlichiosis and Babesia, or Babesiosis. And these are two other tick-borne diseases that really weren't in this area up until just recently. But we've actually had several cases of these things in the last couple of years. And they can be much more severe and cause more severe illness than Lyme. And sometimes they can even occur simultaneously. You okay. can actually have co-infection with Lyme and one of these other things. Um, things to be aware of, um, really high fever, Okay. Which Lyme usually gives sort of more of a low-grade fever. Low-grade fever. Yeah, uh, mild flu-like yeah, flu flu. symptoms. These are really higher fever, 102, 103. Okay. They can cause anemia, hemolytic anemia, where destroying the red blood cells. Um, it's specifically Babesia is a parasite okay. that actually infects the red blood cells and causes them to destroy themselves. Um, and that's, it's treatable, but we've got to get you in. We've got to get you get tested it. for it. Get it diagnosed quickly. Right. And Ehrlichia has very, very similar symptoms to Lyme. And what's the, uh, the kind of onset? How, how long does it take for that to kind of incubate the body for the symptoms? It can be several so, weeks. It can be several weeks. One okay. to three weeks. All right. After, uh, again, After a bite. And is it the same tick, essentially, that carries all of these diseases? Ehrlichia yeah. is, uh, the sa is the same tick, and Babesia can be a different one. Can be a different one. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So I think the, the moral of, of, of the tick bite diseases here is that they get diagnosed early. Sure. Uh, if you think you've been bit by a tick or don't know how long you may have had a tick on you, uh, get evaluated, you know, check your symptoms. Don't ignore your symptoms for sure. Uh, and then, you know, get properly evaluated by, sure. by your internist or, you know, family doctor. And let's not underscore prevention of getting bitten by a tick. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so if you're going to be out working in the, in the garden, if you're going to be out doing, you know, house, you know, work around the house, let's get you sprayed with uh, insect repellent. And don't be afraid of DEET. Okay. Everybody thinks that DEET is this awful chemical because it sounds like DDT. Yes. <laughs> uh, it's not. It's been around for decades, and um, it's very effective. It's one of the few things that ticks and mosquitoes will stay away from. Actually, it works. Yeah. And it, it's an, it's and an like effective. like you mentioned, with the, with the mild winter this year, you know, this summer could be challenging it's be a bad for, year. for, you know, uh, these various, you know, mosquito-borne viruses that are coming, yes. you know, up the coast, you know, from, from the Caribbean and, and kind of working their way up into the United States. You know, that's going to be challenging for doctors to differentiate all of these sure. different, different I'm getting things. getting questions about Zika. Yes. And <laughs> the sure. answer is, we're just not sure yet. We're we just not know sure. it's bad for pregnant women. Right, right. And it doesn't seem to be so bad for people who aren't pregnant. Okay. Um, but we really don't know. We, we don't know what the effect is going to be, and we don't know what the impact is going to be. Right. And I, I don't know if there's any diagnosed cases in the county as of yet that I, I'm aware not of. Not that I'm aware of. Okay. I all think right, there might have been one in Connecticut. All right. But not that I know of, no. All right, so obviously your whole day isn't spent doing tick bites. So tell, let's talk about what, some other things, you know, just, just general management of, uh, of sure. people's health. Sure. Uh, you know, you mentioned, like, you know, gardening in spring and, and, you know, people start becoming more active and they start exercising more maybe when they were sedentary over the winter. We and, hope they exercise more. Yeah, yeah, well, you hope so. But, but some people may not be ready for exercise, right? Sure. So they may have first signs of maybe some, you know, cardiac issues or if they're gardening and they do something and they've, 
you know, they have a back problem or they have, you know, as an internist, you see, you know, a wide gamut of, of various, you know, injuries and, and illnesses. And, you know, how do you manage, uh, you know, just your, your typical high cholesterol patient, sure. hypertension patient, sure. uh, you know, maybe some mild angina uh, patients. And, uh, you know, are you uh, a doctor who's, you know, prescribe first or do you talk about lifestyle changes, health style changes, how people can maybe not be on you know, lipid uh, sure. uh, lowering medicines, which we know have other side effects. Uh, tell me how you manage sure. you know, patients. I tend to be fairly conservative with medications and that goes for antibiotics for viral infections. We don't give antibiotics for colds. Right. <laughs> you, know, you don't get a Z-Pack yeah. if you have a, a sniffle. Yes. Although people will ask for it. Yes. They, Sometimes they, they demand. Will. Yes, absolutely. Just give me a Z-Pack. Yeah. Uh, so I tend to be fairly conservative with medications. So if someone comes in for the first time and we're doing a routine physical, and by the way, don't underscore or don't uh, not get a physical. There's some studies out there now and some people saying, oh, the yearly physical isn't really necessary. The, the, the yield on it isn't very good. And I can point you to people who I picked up stuff that they would have otherwise not known about. Sure. Yeah. And some of them, could have been deadly a short time later. Absolutely. Yeah. So don't, you know, get a physical. Yeah, general physical, some general blood work, chemistries, Absolutely. you know, lipid panel profiles. It's a, it's you know. a smart thing to do, yeah. and it also develops the relationship with your doctor. Yes. It's important that you know me and I know you. Absolutely. And that's one of the values of having an internist. That's not necessarily related to, uh, say, an urgent care. That's sort of, that's another trend that I'm sort of seeing in medicine right now, is that there's a lot of urgent care uh, centers popping up. Right. And, and these are good, and people can go there if they have a sore throat and something that's, you know, so it's Sunday night and a nice spike yeah, of or, fever. Yeah. But they don't know you. Right. It's a different uh, relationship. And it's very sure. difficult for them to sort of manage long-term long -term right. issues. So you really need a relationship with a doctor that you trust. Absolutely. So getting back to what I was saying about the medications, I tend to be fairly conservative. So if somebody comes in and their blood pressure is sort of elevated, well, number one, I'm going to check it again at the end of the exam and maybe do two or th three more readings because blood pressure is a very, what we call, labile thing. It, it varies from moment to moment. Sure. It can be low and you're sitting here talking to somebody and then you start thinking about all the things you have to do later on and you can have a spike or you're stuck in traffic on the way here. Right. And it, or just it that spike. anxiety going to the doctor's office in general. Of course, you know? we see that quite a bit called white coat syndrome. Sure. And we see people, well, it's always fine when I check it at home, but every time I'm here, you know, it's 160 over 90. Yeah. <laughs> so the first thing I do, let's, let's take blood pressure. I very rarely will prescribe medication right off the bat. Um, I will say, listen, you know, you're 20 pounds overweight. Why don't you try to lose a little bit of weight, exercise a little bit, cut down on salt, things like this. Come back in four to six weeks and we'll check it again. Blood pressure isn't the kind, unless you're off the charts and about to have a stroke, it's, not the, it's the kind of thing where you can take your time with it and watch it and maybe give somebody a chance to reduce things on their own. And make some lifestyle changes, sure. make some recommendations. And, and as, as an internist, because you do see so many things that you probably can tell are preventable to some degree, you know, maybe some you know, early type 2 diabetes, you know, high cholesterol, hypertension. Yes. You know, we, we could all probably agree that if most people ate well, exercised moderately, and lived you know, pretty clean lives, a lot of those disease patterns go away. You know, they it, go it, away, yeah. you see those, that curve just drop right off. Right. Sometimes you get a patient who you give, the, listen, you're pre-diabetic. Your glucose is a little bit on the high side. If, we, if you don't do X, Y, and Z, you're gonna be a full-blown diabetic and all the implications that come along with that. And it really lights a fire under them. And they say, you know what, you're right. I've been doing this and I've been doing that and I'm not, I'm not eating right, I'm not exercising. And it really allows them to change their life. It gives them that, that impetus to make these lifestyle changes that maybe they wouldn't have otherwise, but now I said, listen, you have to do this now. And they become very healthy people. They lose 20, 30 pounds, now they're eating healthy, they're exercising, and it was the best thing that ever happened to them. Yeah, and that all came from a visit with a family internal Correct. medicine doctor, which is, which is great. I think there's not enough emphasis on the importance of, like you said, having that relationship with your clientele and actually being able to make changes in, in their lives uh, early on before disease patterns uh, get too far along. Uh, and then sometimes, you know, they're not necessarily reversible, or then you do have to do, uh, you know, a pharmacology you know, management with those patients. And then there could be other side effects and other things sure. going down the road. So, and that's another subset yeah. of patients. You know, some of these things, whether it's high cholesterol, heart disease, diabetes, you know, there's a big genetic component. Sure. And 
it really varies from person to person. You know, I've seen people who are 400 pounds and have perfect cholesterol, and people who are 180 pounds and have horrible cholesterol. And they eat healthy and they're doing all the right things because the genetics are weighted so much, so much to, the, to the extreme for, for both of them. Most people are someplace yes, in the middle. Type 2 hyperlipidemia or something that's more genetic based. Correct. Now, now does that, you know, there's some, you know, I would say controversy, but some doctors, maybe along more the integrative medicine model, mm -hmm. you know, don't always feel that all high cholesterol patients need to be treated just to lower the total cholesterol if the ratio is Absolutely. Good. You don't treat numbers on a page. Yeah. You, you have to look at the individual. You know, if somebody comes in and they have moderately high cholesterol and they have no family history of premature heart disease and uh, they have some room for improvement, then you say, okay, well, I'm not in any particular rush to put you on a statin. You know, let's, let's do lifestyle modification. And even if you're sort of running a little bit on the high side, I may not have to be so aggressive. There's actually some new uh, tools that doctors are using uh, based on some recent studies where you, you plug in their age and uh, their actual numbers and their family history. Are they a smoker? Are they a diabetic? And it'll calculate uh, a 10-year risk. A risk factor. Like and a, if it yeah. falls below a certain level, it kind of gives you... Uh, sort of a, that second opinion and saying, you know what, I feel comfortable not treating this person right, because based, there's some actual data behind it. Based on the risk factors. Based on these risk factors that maybe I can let them go with a moderately high number because they, their risk is of having a, an event, whether it be a heart attack or a stroke, in a certain period of time. Now, as a, as a general internalist, you know, besides the typical things we think about, people don't think about the musculoskeletal system as common as they should because as a doctor you know people come in with this hurts and that hurts and sure. what's going on with my knee, what's going on with my hip, what's going on with my back or they'll have an acute episode uh, where you're like, uh, you know, I was gardening like we talked about or I went running and you know, so how do you manage those and, and do you, you know, do you work with those patients, you know, with uh, you know, other types of practitioners, you know, physical therapists and chiropractors, orthopedics oh, by to, all to means. kind of manage those patients as well because sometimes you're going to be the first person again to see that patient because you're their doctor. I should know? be the first, I, yeah. I should always be the, the first yeah. call. Yeah. And then I'll, we'll tell you what to do after that. Either 90% yeah. of the of good internists should be able to handle 90% of what walks in the door. You know, not every headache case has to see a neurologist. Right. And not every underactive thyroid case has to see an endocrinologist. A good internist can really manage, or not every hypertension has to see a cardiologist. Yeah. A good yeah. internist should be able to manage Quarter, these things. Quarterback the uh, patient, basically. Absolutely, and I yeah. use that analogy yeah. all the time. Yeah. Uh, maybe the captain of the ship or, or, or quarterback of <laughs> the team. Um, but sure, I've actually become uh, very reliant on physical therapy, um, chiropractors in general, because as in one of the things that I really, but beyond giving somebody a muscle relaxer or an anti-inflammatory, once that's exhausted, I'm kind of done. Whereas, you know, somebody like you, uh, physical therapists and chiropractors can actually do more manipulation and exercise and some strength building to... Uh, get at the, the underlying cause of the problem, rather than me just putting a Band-Aid on it and saying, well, let's take some muscle relaxer and, get, and loosen up. Yeah, because uh, sometimes, not a lot of patients, but they, they, people do want a quick fix. You know, they really do want to get better quickly, and if, if pain is their, their driving force, sure. you know, they might want a, you know anti-inflammatory, like I said, a muscle relaxer. And the meds relaxer. help. You know, yeah, everything and, works, and works best it. when we work together as a team. Yeah, and, and the goal is, you know, as a preventative doctor, is to try and get them to the, where their body's functioning optimally without the use of medications and sure. drugs uh, and just have them working. I do a know, lot. I advocate so. stretching very often. I tell people about stretching, um, really preventing a problem b before it arises. And you know, you talk about the musculoskeletal system, it's certainly very much a part of everything and you can get a lot of physical manifestations. I see stress and anxiety cause musculoskeletal problems all the time. Absolutely. One of the more yeah. common things Probably I the see. the most common thing. And headache, oh, yeah. headaches. Most headaches, headaches are 80, 89% Absolutely. Headaches. Muscle. But even things you yeah. wouldn't necessarily TMJ, equate you know. TMJ. Yeah. I get at least one or two of these a week where someone comes in panicking because they have tingling in their hand. And if it's the left side, yeah, they, they get even they, more, they get even, they yes. get even more nervous. Right. And they say, either I'm having a stroke or a heart attack. And I walk around back and I you know, press on a, a particular muscle. And I said, does this hurt? Yeah. Well, that's, yeah. is it tingling now? Yeah. And okay, well, it's not having a heart attack or yeah. stroke, and they're very relieved. And I say, you're under a lot of stress, right? You know, lately, absolutely. Well, this is what's going on, and people don't realize how connected all these things are. That tingling in your hand can be from stress and anxiety. Right. 
So it's important that people realize that. There's a lot of things. And then you did mention some thyroid uh, issues and things of that nature. That, that tends to be common more in females, you know, hypothyroidism. Uh, and that may be something where people, again, you know, that fatigue factor you mm -hmm. spoke about, I, I wanted to go circle back to that. We kind of start with that. Sure. Fatigue is just, you know, it's common in everyone these days. We're, we're high stressed. We're not sleeping as much. Absolutely. We're running around with our kids. Our diets probably aren't good. You know, we're not great. Uh, you know, some of us eat better than others. Um, you know, are you believer in supplementation to help with that, you know, and then also B12 sure. injections and the, you know, things of those natures that it, will help. It, it depends. Yeah. Um, fatigue is one of the more common complaints. I get at least one or two a day Yes. that their chief complaint is, I'm just tired. And we have a, a panel that we typically do for a fatigue patient. You check their blood count, make sure they're not anemic. You check their thyroid, you check the Lyme. So you sort of run through the checklist of the common medical causes for fatigue. And I would say 80% of the time, you're not finding anything there. And I tell them, listen, this is probably going to come up normal. And then we're left with, well, what else is causing this? And, well, are you sleeping well? Yeah, right. You know, and yeah. often that's Four not Four hours the case. of sleep doesn't Yeah, well, <laughs> there we go. You yeah. know, that, that's, that's it yeah. right there. People underestimate um, sleep apnea. Are you snoring a lot? You know, sleep apnea can cause not just fatigue, but lack of mental sharpness. Um, people can't do their jobs as well. Um, and it's all because they're not sleeping well. They don't even realize they're not sleeping and well. And they don't even realize it because yeah. that's the nature of sleep apnea. Yeah, they, they think will, they're sleeping for seven yeah, hours. They're waking up every you know, couple of minutes. That's right, but they're whatever. not coming to full, to yeah. full alertness. Yes. So they have no idea that this is going on. So th there's sometimes very simple reasons for these things. And then sometimes you're just left with, hey, your life is too stressful. You're burning the candle at both ends. You're not sleeping well. I, I don't know what to do for you. You, know, yeah. you. you have to try to work on that yourself. And then, uh, you know, I guess some doctors will evaluate, in some cases, adrenal cortisol levels sure. to see if that's, you know, there are different variations of checking cortisol levels and sure. adrenal uh, function and uh, potentially, like I said, treating those, those patients sure. uh, for uh, better sleep and reducing their cortisol so it's not constantly, like, Absolutely. you know, flared that's, up. And you that's know. coming, we're, we're starting to get into more of that stuff, too. And you mentioned supplements. I tend not to be a huge supplement person. I, if you can try to get your nutrients from your food, it's a much better way to do things. Sure. Um, for those that will do it. And for those that will do it. Yeah. And if you can't, then we can certainly look at supplementation. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned B12 shots, and that's another common thing that people come in. Sure. I'm tired. Can't you just give me a B12 shot or something? Oh, yeah. And, you know, that works if you're B12 deficient, yes. which most people aren't these days, unless you have, uh, you know, certain medical causes for, for low B12. If you come in with a normal B12 level and I give you a B12 shot, if you feel better, it's a placebo effect. If you're truly deficient, I can make you feel better in a week. You know, once you start to get the shots, you do feel better right away. Yeah, because the body rebounds from the deficiency. Absolutely. Yeah. But if you're not truly deficient, giving you a B12 shot, while probably harmless, it truly really shouldn't do it's very right. much. It's not going to do much. Right? No, it's going to get a placebo effect. And, and people talk about vitamin D uh, as another, you know, that you test for Good vitamin question. D. Good question. We do. Yeah. Uh, about three, four years ago, the recommendations came that we should start to screen people for vitamin D deficiency. You know what we found? Everybody's vitamin D deficient. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I would say, making these phone calls, you know, when you're talk, telling people about their blood tests, are, I feel like I'm the broken record. I say, oh, and your vitamin D is deficient. You should take a supplement. And that's one of the things that I do supplement very often is vitamin D. A vitamin D. And we're finding more and more links with vitamin D deficiency with all kinds of diseases. You know, traditionally you think of it with, with calcium absorption. The, one of the main functions of vitamin D is that it acts as, uh, as a hormone that helps you absorb vitamin D, uh, calcium, excuse me, calcium from your diet. Right, so for women for osteoporosis, or right. trying to prevent osteoporosis down the, the Correct. line. Correct, you need the D to absorb the calcium from your diet. Okay. But it goes very much beyond that too. Then there's, we're finding that D deficiency affects immunity and potentially certain cancers. Okay. So it's, so it's, it's a big like, focus right. these days. Okay. It's a big topic. All right, that's great. Well, that's why I wanted to bring up the vitamin thing because I guess there are certain vitamins that are sort of making the news, you know. Sure. And then there's other things that maybe don't make the news. Sure. And then there's, you know, And there's ones you shouldn't take. Right, right. I still see people coming in uh, taking vitamin E yes. supplementation, yes. which really has gone out of vogue. Yes. Yeah. A lot of study, it was given maybe back in the 80s and 90s. Yeah, um, popping E Popping E vitamin yeah. E. They thought it helped prevent cardiovascular disease. And then in the last few years, we found that, well, not only is it not good, it can actually be harmful. Yeah. Well, too much of anything probably is Absolutely. not good. And they say, well, yeah. I'll just pee it out. Well, no, not E. Yeah. Because E, <laughs> e is a fat-soluble vitamin. Your body stores it in fat cells. Yes. It and and it. It, it can become toxic. 
Yeah, so th 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 that's, uh, that's interesting. And I think people should have some guidance in there, and I think sometimes, you know, they go to a, a, a GNC or some, you know, and they just say, you know, and they're asking the clerk basically, sure. you know, what yeah. they should be taking, and, and I don't think that that's the best way to do it. I think it is not. some professional guidance uh, is, is necessary. Uh, I think there are, there's also, I think there's good whole food supplementation. Yes. Where whole foods that were actually made from real food is very similar to processing food in your body. Not quite the same as eating kale on a, on a plate, but uh, can be better because the way that your body has to break down that whole food supplementation. I agree. And uh, it, it can uh, work better for the patient. I would agree so. with that. If you're going to head for a supplement, that's probably a better kind of a supplementation to do yeah. is something like that. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing I also find that every time something new hits the media, you know, for a while it was resveratrol, yes. the red wine. Yeah, well, yeah. lower cholesterol. Yeah. yeah, and they said, well, if drinking two glasses of red wine keeps the French healthy, then let's take the equivalent of 100 glasses of wine <laughs> in a capsule yeah. every day. Yes. And that really didn't pan out either. No, no. You know, they said, oh, it's going to keep us young. Resveratrol yeah. is going to be the fountain of youth. And it's not. Yeah. And I, I tend to really take a common sense approach to just about all of these things. When the new trend hits, I, I very rarely jump on it without waiting to see a little bit. And I also just advocate a common sense healthy diet. Yeah, you have to get the, the data, and, and like we spoke about before, lifestyle, you know, proper diet, you know, sure. moderate exercise, 90% of a sure. lot of issues go away. You know, I, in all socioeconomic areas, you know, that you see different trends, and, and we understand that different areas throughout the country may have higher percentages of diabetes and heart disease and, and, and obesity based on, you know, uh, lifestyle and genetics and uh, social economic issues. But at the end of the day, uh, if everyone just had the education from their doctors, uh, you know, and, and just from other uh, support, professional support, I think that, you know, I think our healthcare system, you know, in, in general in the U.S., you talked about, you know, conglomerate medicine and, and the big guys buying up everything. Sure. And, you know, that's a whole other show, really. Absolutely. But, but the whole point is uh, I think that the, your family doctor, your internist uh, is a really critical, important role in the management of, of uh, patients' care. And I think it's important that all of our viewers recognize uh, that they should have that one relationship with that one doctor, that they shouldn't have to rush to urgent care with a sniffle or, or an ear infection or a sinus infection, or they should be able to speak to a doctor that knows them well. Absolutely. And, you know, urgent, urgent care is urgent care. Emergencies are emergencies. And but it has its place. There's, yes. there's, there's, there's no yeah, doubt about that. And you have to have a guy that you're comfortable with, or, yeah, or gal. Yeah, gal. You have yes. to have uh, yeah. a doctor that you're comfortable with. Yeah. But you have to be able to share even the thing you may not want to share with, with somebody else. You have to have that that confidence in the person that you're talking to, to say, I'm embarrassed to talk about it, but, but here it is. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I think it's been a great show. I think it was very informative for our viewers. I want to thank you for, for being here. Thank and, you so uh, much for having me. And uh, we'll, we'll see you in town, right? Absolutely, I'll be <laughs> okay. around. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for watching Health IQ. I'm Dr. Siegel. Uh, we'll see you at the next show. Bye-bye.